Chapter 9 Cassie enrolled all the girls in school the next day. An influx of fifteen girls into their small one-room schoolhouse was a bit much for the teacher. She immediately gave graduation tests to the three oldest girls, and they all passed with flying colors. Ruby found a job at the general store, sewing shirts for local cowboys. It wouldn't have been her first choice of professions, but it gave her something to do until David was able to send for her. Opal went to work for a local ranching family with a mother, who was the town doctor. Opal had never met a lady doctor, and she found herself talking about her every night. Cassie had yet to meet the great Iris Harvey, but she already felt slightly intimidated by her. Evelyn took a job as a teaching assistant for the local schoolhouse. With an extra twelve girls sitting in the classroom, the teacher needed all the help she could get. Evelyn helped Cassie keep her finger on the pulse of the activity of the girls she had raised, letting her know the instant one of them stepped out of line. Cassie spent a lot of time alone, always before, while the children were in school, there were things that needed to be done around the house. Edna Petunia kept the house as neat as a pin, so she didn't feel like she was needed in that regard. Edna and Sarah Jane had become fast friends, and Sarah Jane helped Edna make every meal. She wasn't surprised when she didn't get the promised money from the church in New York. They had sent her and the girls away with no intention of ever helping them again. What made her truly sad was Tino. He was gone. She hoped he would at least write, but she received no letters. She knew he'd been heading to Fort Worth to see if he could find his brother, and then he was supposed to take the bus back to New York. After that, she had no idea where his search and his travels would take him. Every day Cassie felt a little bit less necessary to the girls' lives. Where once they had come to her with every little problem, now they sometimes came to her, but mostly went to Edna Petunia. The woman kept everyone laughing. The girls all adored her immediately. Cassie began to think that she was no longer needed, she'd devoted the last fifteen years to taking care of the children from the orphanage, and now they didn't need her. She had no idea what to do with her life if she wasn't needed by the children. No one said anything to her, but she knew. She knew it was time for her to move on. The children were content, happier than they'd ever been. So why did she stay? She wondered if she should get a job doing something else. What could she do? She'd worked with children for so long, she wasn't sure she had any other skills. They'd been in nowhere for about three weeks when Edna Petunia went to Cassie. It's time those girls of ours had new clothes. Let's go to the mercantile and get some fabric for the dresses that the two of us are going to get to sewing. Cassie couldn't argue with her. The girls were still wearing the same hand-me-downs they'd been wearing for years. They weren't even new when they first came to the orphanage. Yes Penelope had done a wonderful job updating them and making them look nicer, but the fabric was still worn. New clothes were a necessity. Cassie spent a pleasant afternoon with the older woman, choosing fabric for the girls. When they walked in, the merchant behind the counter pulled out a huge box. Here's your monthly order of peppermint sticks. Edna Petunia smiled. Oh good. I was almost out. What would I have done if a small child had fallen in front of me, and I hadn't had a peppermint stick? The owner of the mercantile shrugged at her. Cassie could tell he was still trying to figure the older woman out. How long have you lived in nowhere? Cassie asked Edna. Surely if she'd been there any length of time, the other people in town would just take her in stride. Just a few months, I came here with Iris Sullivan, the new doctor. Her mother didn't want her traveling alone as a single woman. And she really didn't want her living alone as a single woman. So I came with her as her nurse and companion. Cassie was confused. I thought the doctor in town was Iris Harvey. Sure. Iris married Francis Harvey not long after we arrived. He needed a mother for those sweet girls of his. Edna's face softened as she mentioned the Harvey girls. She obviously cared deeply for them. And how long have you been married, Edna Petunia? Cletus and I married about three weeks before you got here. Edna beamed, obviously happy about finally being married. Were you married before? Edna Petunia was old enough to have married and buried eight men. Edna shook her head. No, I was engaged once. He died though. 
She sighed happily. Cletus makes me happy. He's a really good man. He needs to bathe a little more often, but being a bachelor for forty years will do that to a man. Cassie smiled. I'm sure it will. Edna leaned close to Cassie's ear. Don't tell anyone, but I married a younger man. She spoke the words as if they were some kind of scandalous secret. Cassie put her hand over her mouth to hide her giggle. You did? Edna Petunia nodded. He's only sixty-nine. Cassie was afraid to ask how old Edna Petunia was, so she didn't. Obviously she was older than sixty-nine. You seem very well matched. Why? Because we're both old and senile? Edna's eyes were dancing as she asked the question. Cassie wanted to say yes, but she couldn't be that rude. No, you just seem very happy together. I like seeing that. You need to go after Tino. Edna selected four bolts of cloth and carried them to the front of the store. How had Edna even known? She had never said a word about her feelings for Tino. Cassie selected five bolts of cloth and carried them to the front. When she met Edna Petunia back at the fabric table, she asked, Why do you say that? Edna smiled. I saw the way you two were watching each other. More likely, the way you two were trying not to look at each other. Cassie sighed. He's searching for his brother. He doesn't have time for a wife. Why not? Seems to me he could search just as well with a wife in his bed. He obviously cares about you. Edna carried two more bolts up to the front of the store. Cassie picked up the last four bolts they'd chosen, carrying them to the front of the store. I don't even know where he is anymore. He knows where I am. If he decides he's ready for a wife, I'll be here. Edna shook her head. Seems to me if you love a man, you're willing to go after him. I think I would if I knew where he was. But I don't. So I'll have to wait for him to come find me. Edna shrugged as she paid the merchant and helped carry everything out to the wagon. She muttered under her breath about women who are afraid to do anything, but she said nothing else to Cassie about it. The following week was better for Cassie. She kept busy making new dresses for the girls. She and Edna decided to wait until all the dresses were finished before they gave them to the girls. They worked endlessly during the day while the girls were in school, so that they could surprise them. On the evening all the dresses were ready, Edna Petunia made a special meal for everyone. In each of their chairs, she placed a dress wrapped in brown paper. They had used the girls' old dresses as patterns to make sure they made them the right sizes. When the girls came to dinner and pulled their chairs out, there were many squeals. The girls had received way too few gifts in their lives. They had no idea what the presents were, but just the fact that they had presents made them happy. They waited until everyone was sitting, before they opened their packages. Penelope held hers up in front of her, and smiled. Oh, it's beautiful. I couldn't have done better myself. Cassie laughed, you know as well as I do you could have done much better. But I'll take the compliment. She looked around at everyone. You have to all try them on after dinner, and show us. Edna Petunia beamed at everyone. She was thrilled the girls enjoyed their surprise. She had made a special cake for dessert as well, and she knew the girls would be excited. They had just started eating when there was a knock at the front door. Cletus got up to check to see who it was. Well looky who's here. You forget something when you left? Cassie looked up and saw Tino looking down at her. I didn't think you'd ever come back. Tino shook his head. You know I was looking for my brother. Cassie shrugged. Did you find him? She'd prayed every day that he would find his brother. He could never settle down until he did. Tino nodded. He's a lawman in Fort Worth. Was he happy to see you? Edna Petunia glared at Cassie. Where are your manners, girl? Tino, sit down and have supper with us. After the meal, you take Cassie for a walk just like your courtin'. And you can tell her all about it. Tino bit back a laugh as he pulled out a chair. Minnie jumped up and got Tino a plate, glass, and utensils. We're happy you came back to us, Mr. Hayes. Mrs. Morgan has been sad without you. Tino frowned at Cassie. You have? 
Cassie shrugged. She moved her meat around on her plate with her fork. How on earth was she supposed to respond to that question? She suddenly lost her appetite, wondering why he'd come back. Did he care about her after all? After they'd had cake, Tino stood and offered his arm to Cassie. We'll be back within the hour. As soon as they were out of the house, Cassie asked, Why are you here? Tina waited a moment before responding, instead walking her down behind the stable. I missed you, he said simply. He pulled her into his arms and kissed her longingly. Cassie rested her forehead against his shoulder. I missed you, too. I wasn't sure you were going to come back. Tino wrapped his arm around her shoulders and continued their walk. How do the girls like it here? Do they get along with the old bat? Cassie smiled at his term for Edna Petunia. They love her, and she loves them. For the first time in my adult life, I feel absolutely unnecessary. Edna does everything they need. Her voice was wistful, telling him everything he needed to know about her feelings of uselessness. He stopped walking and looked at her with surprise. Does that mean you can leave? I bought a little house not far outside of town. There's no land really, but I got a job as a cowboy at a local ranch. It won't make me rich, but it will be enough to support a wife. Cassie looked at him with astonishment. You did? I didn't think you'd ever settle anywhere. I couldn't while I was looking for my brother. I found him. Now I can settle down. He sighed. Sebastian didn't really remember having a brother. I mean, he had some memories of an older boy that was with him all the time, but very few. He's two years younger than me. He's married now. His wife is expecting. He's happy. We'll write, but dot well, we're never going to be close if that makes sense. How do you feel about that? She asked, searching his face. She didn't want him to be sad that his only kin had a life that really didn't include him. Tino thought about that for a moment. I think a year ago, I'd have been devastated. Heck, two months ago, I'd have been upset. Now, it gives me the opportunity to live for myself. And for the woman I love. He took a deep breath, his eyes meeting hers. Cassie Morgan, I've never met a woman who made me want to settle down before. Ever since I met you, it's the only thing I've been able to think about. Would you do me the honor of becoming my wife? Cassie bit her lip. It doesn't bother you that I'm older than you? Why would it? She had no arguments for him. She nodded emphatically. Yes, I'll marry you. I can't think of anything I'd rather do. Tino grabbed her and pulled her into his arms, lifting her off her feet and swinging her in a circle. I'm going to make you the happiest woman alive. Cassie laughed. You already have. Loving him the way she did, was it any wonder? She couldn't wait to see the little house they'd share. The girls were in good hands with Edna Petunia. She'd be close by if there were a problem. Yes, she was finally free to marry, and she'd met the perfect man for her.